you. So let's take a breath together. Welcome, and we're going to dive right in. So my name is Matt Sturm. You are here for my video series called The Organic Masculine. This is part number three, where we will be discussing the masculine archetypes. So thank you on Zoom for being here. Uh, you. you are welcome to type in your questions at any point along the way, and I'll pick them up as we go. Also, we are live streaming to Facebook. So hello and welcome to all the friends on Facebook. Thanks for being a part of this. Okay, so archetypes. Let's start by looking at what they are. Archetypes are patterns of meaning and identity that developed together with humans. These include our myths and deities, and they're basically symbols in the collective unconscious. Archetypes are universal, indefinable, and unbounded. So the symbol, uh, I'm live streaming. Thank you for checking. No record right now. So the symbol and the archetype is the universal aspect of consciousness that we can all kind of tap into. And then the myths and the deities are the um, particular um, interpretations that each culture gives to that universal symbol. So what we're looking at is the universal underlying pattern of meaning or identity um, and how each of us can relate to that. Here's a quote from Richard Tarnas. Um, Jung had come to view archetypes as innate symbolic forms and psychological dispositions that unconsciously structure and impel human behavior and experience at both the personal and collective level. They are self-portraits of the instincts and render human experience meaningful according to certain timeless universal patterns. So this archetypal work, looking at the masculine archetypes in particular, traces back to Jung um, originally, and then beyond him, um, there was a book in the, I think, late 1980s or early 1990s that came out came, called King, Warrior, Magician, Lover by two authors, Moore and Gillette. And they were part of the 1990s men's movement and did a lot of the um, theoretical foundation work around masculine archetypes for men. So the first ones that we will look at are these archetypal roles. And the roles are the particular identity that we inhabit within ourselves and within a collective over the course of a lifetime. These roles in Western civilization are, are gendered. They're split between masculine and feminine. So the feminine has her own mother, maiden, crone set of archetypes, and these are for the masculine. Um, they go together with aging and physiological or biological development, but the archetype is a separate thing. And we don't necessarily bring the archetype or advance to the next archetype with us as we get older. So the, the main archetypes for the masculine in his life cycle is the golden boy, the hero, the man, and then the elder. And the way that we transition between archetypal roles is the old role needs to die as the sovereign center. And then the new role needs to be born and inhabit, come into the center. In traditional, like indigenous cultures, this is largely done through rites of passage and initiation. And I argued in the first video that this is largely what we have lost through the modernization of Western culture, is the rites of passage into more mature archetypal roles. So while we may have you know, many adult human beings um, walking around the world looking like fully mature adults, they haven't connected to the archetype of the man or the elder. We're still largely at an adolescent heroic level society. 
And this is one of the most important messages of why men's work matters and why women's work matters. Because the archetypes are gendered, we get them through gender. Um, we do it in men's circles or women's circles, etc. Another little point here. So the archetypes are connected to the sovereign sen sense of the self. Who am I? Where am I making my decisions from? Where is my behavior um, coming from? And who do I believe myself to be? Who is the self that's here? So at the child stage, this is a pre-egoic, um, and there's many stages of consciousness and development that child psychology maps out. Then in adolescence, we have the ego, and that's the rational mind. That's the that's the cognitive function, um, sorting and filtering function of the frontal brain. We tend to think of the ego as being the adult consciousness, and what I'm going to argue is that the that's a misperception based on the fact that we live in a fundamentally immature and adolescent society. So the, the ego, which goes with the, the archetype of the hero, is really an adolescent role. And eventually, through maturation and again through initiation, we want to take the next step beyond the ego to a transegoic sense of self, which is centered in the soul. And this is connected to the archetype of the man. So the soul self, what is that? That is the, the place in me that came here in this lifetime to learn certain lessons and to have certain experiences, ultimately to discover the fullness of what that soul is. The soul wants to fill out into and know all of itself. This transegoic part of us was here before we were born and will be here after we die into another life if that's part of your cosmology. But when we tap into past life memories, for example, we're connecting to that soul level of consciousness. So what I'm saying here is that when we step into the fully mature archetype, that corresponds to having a trans-egoic sense of self be center, be in the driver's seat of the bus of this human. The ego doesn't go away. The ego gets transcended and then is included. The ego comes into service of this higher sense of self. Just like the inner child never fully goes away, we always have our inner children with us. And ideally, we learn to work together with them. But they are not, again, ideally, driving the bus of you and me, making all of the decisions. Eventually, as we continue to mature through the life cycle, we get to the point where we're ready to take the next step into elderhood or eldership. And this sovereign center that goes with that is the self with a capital S, also known as the higher self. Um, this is, whereas the soul self is trans egoic, but still individual, it's still particular to me. The higher self is transpersonal. It's no longer, I'm no longer centered in just me and my own journey and my own well-being. My sense of self is universal and all-encompassing. So Christ consciousness, Buddha consciousness, Krishna consciousness, um, various different labels describe this term. And that's what true eldership is, is moving into the universal layer of being. So here's a quote from Bill Plotkin about our society. We live in a largely adolescent world, and it is, in great measure, a pathological adolescence. There is nothing wrong with healthy adolescence, but our cultural resources have been so degraded over the centuries that the majority of humans in, quote, developed societies now never reach true adulthood. An adolescent world being unnatural and unbalanced, inevitably spawns a variety of cultural pathologies, resulting in contemporary societies that are materialistic, greed-based, hostily competitive, violent, racist, sexist, ageist, and ultimately self-destructive. 
These social sim societal symptoms of patho-adolescence, which we see everywhere in the industrialized world today, are not at the root of our human nature, but rather are an effect of our egocentrism, of egocentrism on our humanity. So from my worldview, from my perspective, um, this point that we're making right here is one of the core ways that our culture, that our civilization is dysfunctional, it's broken. And if we are ever going to live in a sustainable world in connection with our environment and all people, this piece needs to get solved. We need humans to be able to advance to all stages of the life cycle. And then for that cycle to turn and flow in the way that it did for millennia for humans, but stopped at a certain point as we um, became egoic. <laughs> so beyond these archetypal roles, I also want to introduce the parts of the psyche of which there are four. I mentioned the authors Moore and Gillette earlier, they are the ones who originated this framework, but the framework that I'm gonna give builds on what they did and diverges in certain ways. So what you're getting is my interpretation of it. So Carl Jung believed that there were four parts of the psyche, but he didn't call them these archetypes. Um, however, different cultures and different indigenous religious traditions throughout human history and across different continents have divided the psyche up into four parts. So this is not a brand new and unique phenomenon. So the four archetypal masculine parts are the king, the magician, the warrior, and the lover. Um, we could degenderize this and say the monarch instead of the king, or for the feminine version of it, it would be the queen instead of the king. Um, but my sense, at least my sense, is that all humans have these four parts in some way, and the magician, the warrior, the lover, and then the sovereign monarch, whatever you want to call that, form the, the quadrants of the circle of the psyche. In the center of the circle, here I have the organic masculine, but it's really the sovereign center of the self, whether that's a pre-egoic, egoic, soul, or capital S self, whatever version of that is, resides in the center. And when these four parts are all lined up and working in harmony, and they're in balance, then they feed into our connection to the center of who I am. I find myself, and I'm living from a place of balance, of coherence. And when the masculine psyche has all of these online and balanced, that creates the framework for the organic masculine. Sometimes when I work with groups of men, I ask them to consider if there is ever a time in their life when they are inhabiting their masculinity, when they are not acting through one of these four archetypes. Now, men have an inner feminine, and we all have a contrasexual other in Jungian psychology. But when we're inhabiting the masculine, when I'm in my masculine, generally, except for like very small kind of corner cases, I'm in one of these four quadrants. And so this is why this is a very powerful framework is because it covers almost all of the landscape of me as a masculine being when I'm expressing or behaving or identifying in my masculine. To put a little bit more flavor and color on these parts and just to kind of spread the awareness of it out a little bit, we can consider this to be a mandala, whereas um, some mandalas are a map of the universe. This is a mandala, a map of the psyche, you know, as outside, as without, so within. So the king could be the sense of beingness, the magician thinking, the warrior acting, and the lover feeling. It's four aspects of um, the psyche, being, thinking, acting, and feeling. We could also correlate them with the cardinal directions. The king would be north. Magician East, the rising sun, the warrior South, and the lover West. I know that 
some traditions switch the magician and the lover from what I have here. They have the magician in the West and the lover in the East, and there's no right or wrong. It's just uh, whatever makes sense to you. And this is what feels right in my body. We can also map these to the elements. So the king maps to the element of earth, the magician to wind. So the intellect and thinking connects to the wind or air element. The warrior is fire, action and fire in the south go together for me. And then the lover is water, which is connected to feeling and emotion. In the center, as we extend this metaphor, we have the center point and the element of space, spaciousness. So let's look at, so this model right here with these four quadrants is for the, the man, for the adult, the fully mature uh, version of the psyche. Let's look at how this shifts as we move through different phases and different sovereign centers. So I've got three circles here, one, two, three, corresponding to the hero, the adolescent um, aspect of us, the man, which is the adult, and the elder. So this is the progression of the selves and the parts. So the selves hero goes with the egoic self, the, the man is connected to the soul self, and the elder is connected to the higher us, higher self. And the heroic archetype, the hero and the warrior are blended together. They are kind of one cohesive and like appropriate um, unit archetype. And it's not until we move beyond the hero and the individual ego it's not until we move beyond into the soul sense of this is myself and the man that the king comes online and individuates from the warrior. So the heroic warrior or the heroic ego works in service of his own self-becoming. The ego wants to become the biggest and the best and the most developed ego that it can. And the ego sees itself as a heroic warrior fighting battles and winning and uh, moving into glory. It seeks glory, basically. The initiation, so kind of represented by this arrow right here, that takes us from the heroic ego into the soul self with the man and the king, that initiation is called the willing sacrifice. It's being willing to die or sacrifice our time and energy and resources for the sake of something bigger than us. And that is the action of the ego stepping down from the, the center and making space for something new to emerge, which is the king. And the king archetype in his fullness is the first and last servant of the realm. King is an archetype of service. So that shift is a big one. And then the next shift is equally big because we go from being an individual soul self to a transpersonal, interconnected with all of the universe, kind of universal sense of self. And so the king, the lover, the magician, and the warrior shift from being about me to being about us. So in the true eldership, um, not just like elderly people, but people like the indigenous grandmothers, the 13 indigenous grandmothers, if you're familiar with that group, those grandmothers are in eldership. They are functioning from their version of these archetypes. So what does that mean? The king is kind of the, the single point head of the realm. To transition into eldership is an act of succession. The king steps down, works together with the new heir to the throne and supports that new heir, and then becomes a support for the whole community. When this transition is made, the king becomes legendary. And the legendary king or the legend in this role redefines and pushes the boundaries of what is possible as a human being. 
So it gets written into the collective. King Arthur became a legend. And that legend aspect of him is that he entered into our collective consciousness. He moved beyond King Arthur, the man, into King Arthur, the myth, the legend, the archetypal symbol. He entered that level of consciousness. Briefly, we'll look at the other three. So the lover is about feeling and connection to love and sexuality, sensuality, passion. When it moves into a transpersonal realm, the lover becomes the priest. And the primary action of the priest is devotion in service to the sacred. The priest is the tender of the temple. Feminine side is the priestess. The magician moves into the alchemist. So the role of the magician is to bring us into connection with the sacred to imagine new possibilities for us and to perform magical acts. He lives in a magical world. The alchemist has moved beyond the, the magic of the self and is now the magic of the cosmos moving through us. The alchemist is a, an instrument, so to speak, of those transpersonal forces. And then the warrior, this is a really big one. The warrior moves from being a defender and a fighter, someone who takes action to get things done into the role of a peacemaker. And the shift here is into compassion. And my favorite example of this, the, the human who exemplifies this the most is Mahatma Gandhi. He was a fighter. He affected massive amounts of change and he did it peacefully through compassion, through nonviolent protest. And through that behavior, through that action that he took, he entered into, again, the collective. He became a legend. He was um, working on behalf of basically all beings and is part of our collective consciousness now. Comment here, Dalai Lama as well. Absolutely. Another amazing example of a peacemaker, someone who's working at a transpersonal level of consciousness to affect peace in the world. Beautiful. So this jump from the egoic, heroic self to the soul self of adulthood is described by these two guys who I've been quoting more or referencing more in Gillette. Here's their quote. The hero is the culminating archetypal influence of boyhood. Where the boy's ego is appropriately accessing the hero, he is empowered to differentiate himself from the universe from the complexes and archetypal energies within him, and finally and especially from his mother and father. It enables the boy to slay the internalized parental opinions, values, and controls and break free of their domination. Once this is done, the ego must pass beyond the heroic stage, which is the last stage of legitimate grandiosity, to a, to a condition of true humility. It must offer its loyalty to the transpersonal other in its form as the archetypal king and queen. This entire process, if all goes well, consolidates an emergent ego king axis and leads to mature selfhood. One term that they use here, which is worth fleshing out a little bit, is the ego king axis. So we do not want to become the archetype. Um, the archetype is incredibly powerful. It lives in the collective consciousness. It's vastly larger than any single one of us. When the archetype becomes us, it consumes us. Rather, we want to have a solid sense of self that is able to open and connect to the archetypal energies. And so we want to create an axis, in their terms, between the ego and the king archetype, and an ego lover axis, and a leader ego magician axis. Young, his word here of moving to the self is the process of individuation. And what individuates is the core of me from all of these kind of unconscious behavioral influences of the archetypes. So for him, the process of maturing is largely finding myself 
in relation to and not being owned by the archetypes. So let's go into these a little bit deeper and I'm gonna introduce yet another layer of how I think of these and check and see if there's a question. What does it look like when someone gets stuck in an archetype? Yeah. So let's see. Um, Elvis, Elvis Presley got stuck in an archetype and there's like a quote that he created a monster. Um, rock stars and, you know, mainstream personality figures, they get sucked into this thing and then it takes over and it runs their lives. And if you can't hold and channel that power, it will destroy you. Um, you know, and so we see, um, people who are in the collective sphere of, you know, our spotlight and we shine the spotlight on it, it becomes so strong that they become like look at Michael Jackson or any number of pop stars, it, it warps them. They don't have the sense of self strong enough to hold it. It's a great question. Okay. So now we're going to, I'm going to give you this framework and then we're going to apply it to the four parts of the king, the warrior, the magician, and the lover. So the transcendent archetype, connects to the self and the elder. The integrated archetype connects to the soul and the adult. So this would be the king, the warrior, the magician, or the lover. And when it's unintegrated, they have what I'm calling character strategies. And these come from egoic or pre-egoic, younger adolescent and childhood places within us that are wounded or in some ways not fully integrated into the adult self. Moore and Gillette give their own um, dysfunctions um, and immature versions of the mature archetypes. I'm going to choose different ones based on my training in Hakomi psychotherapy. As far as I know, nobody has put the Hakomi character strategies together with these archetypes, um, but they really fit well. I was totally blown away when I started piecing this together. The reason why I like these strategies and we'll look at them in a second is because behind them is a whole therapeutic process of how to work with them and how to integrate them. So it's much more empowering and enabling instead of saying I'm a tyrant king to say that I am a self-reliant king. And the self-reliant character strategy has a therapeutic process that you can work through either on your own or together with a therapist. So it's, it's deeper and it's richer. So it looks like we are starting with the magician. So the integrated form of this archetype is the magician. The transcendent form is the alchemist. And then the inward and outward character strategies are performing and sensitive and withdrawn. So the performing character strategy, what does that mean? Imagine that I am constantly putting on a show to get somebody's attention. We would say that that's a strategy that I, that my personality has developed along the way in order to get the need met of having attention and feeling like I belong. So somewhere in my childhood, I wasn't getting enough attention. I didn't feel like I belonged. I didn't get those needs met. And so I learned that if I make a show, I will start to get some of that attention that I want. That is the outward version of this character strategy. Inward version of this character strategy is called sensitive and withdrawn. And the idea here is that we live in an over, overwhelming world. And for some of us, those external factors or the internal emotional landscape is so big that all we can do is withdraw to pull into ourselves. And we become overly sensitive to any little ripple or wave that moves through us. And the sensitive withdrawn character strategy is really just trying to find safety in a body, nervous system, or sense of self that is not really quite fleshed out enough or strong enough or solid enough constitution 
to hold the discomfort or pain or trauma of life that had to be endured. So these show up in a variety of different ways. We each have, we can each probably find a place or a time in ourselves where we were in that. When they become integrated, when they feed upward into the magician, the performer of the magician has incredible gifts. The magician's um, capability to put on a show and create magic is an absolute asset when it's not being used to narrowly seek attention for myself. Similarly, the sensitive and withdrawn character strategy gives us the ability to go inside deeply into our internal landscape and connect with the consciousness and space that's in here. And that's part of the magician's um, spell book. That's part of what the magician needs to do. We want to be at choice over this so that we're not overwhelmed and clenching and bracing against ourselves or the world, but rather have the capacity to go inside when we want to and when it's appropriate. Next archetype is the warrior. So I said a little bit about the peacemaker already and the warrior, but let's look at tough, generous, and burdened, enduring these two character strategies. We call them character strategies and they're kind of like not fully formed archetypes. They're just characters. They're little personality traits that we pick up. So the way that tough, generous works, it's the outward face of the warrior is that I have a need to belong and to get my needs met. And at some point in my childhood, that wasn't available to me and power or force were used over me, coercion or for force. So what I internalize is that I need to be tough. I need to put out a big front in order to get my needs met, that if I'm vulnerable, I'm going to be taken advantage of. So I'm tough. But then for people who agree to the power structure of me being dominant, I'm generous. You follow me, I'll take care of you, I'll feed you, I'll give you my resources, you'll be part of mine. And so the, the tough, generous character picks up sidekicks, basically, and kind of pushes people around. But then once you're on the in with them, they, they love you dearly. That is the tough, generous strategy, and it's considered to be, or I'm calling it, um, an unintegrated form of the warrior. The core need is belonging and getting needs met in through vulnerability, but not knowing how to do that. On the flip side is the character strategy called burdened and enduring. And in this strategy, the needs of other people are put above my own needs. I'm caretaking. Um, I'm beholden to all of these other people who, or pets or whatever, all these other aspects of my life that need my time and attention. I have to take care of them, even though it's not really what I want to do. And even though it's not actually feeding or nourishing me. So I grudgingly caretake other people. And there's a layer of resentment that goes with it. I endure it, but I'm burdened. And because I'm not truly free to be me, um, other people's requests are met with resistance. And in this character strategy, I can resist. That is the one place of power that I have. I will be stubbornly sitting here and not moving, and you can't make me move no matter how hard you try. That is the full expression of the burdened and enduring character strategy. It's one I know well. <laughs> So these are the unintegrated um, versions of the warrior archetype. And when they become integrated, they both add something. They both bring their gifts into the warrior. So tough, generous archetype character strategy brings that grit and resolve, the capacity to show up in discomfort and also to be a leader in some ways. And the burdened enduring when it's integrated in, gives us the capacity to be with discomfort, to stay and kind of hold the course, even when times are tough. Question or comment. How would one start integrating 
to warrior from burdened enduring, for example? Yeah, great question. So it's beyond the scope of this talk to go fully into these. Um, it's very deep and super powerful. I, it's juicy. I love these um, character strategies. The burdened enduring strategy is around connecting to my freedom and being in connection to others at the same time. And they're seen as mutually um, exclusive. I can either have my freedom, which isn't really available to me, or I can caretake these people and keep connection here. So the missing experience is being fully liberated as me in relationship. And the more relationships and experiences I can give myself in that framework, the more I'm going to move out of, I have to endure other people. Good question. Our next one that we're going to examine is the lover. So the lover is about feeling and love and romance and intimacy. The priest, as I said, is the transcendent version of this. It takes that love and it turns it into devotion. The character strategies of the lover. Outward strategy is charming and seductive. And the inward is dependent and endearing. So charming and seductive. This character strategy puts on an attractive face, whether it is sexually or just interpersonally. I'm putting on uh, a show in some ways. I'm saying, here's the me that I think that you will like and be attracted to. There is a core insecurity here that the authentic version of me is not going to be liked or accepted or loved. So that's the core need that doesn't get met. And what I learn along the way is that I need to seduce, I need to charm, I need to be funny or witty, or I need to be overly sexual in some way. Um, there are different ways that this show that this comes out, but ultimately the issue is that there's the me that I'm showing you, the mask, and then there's the authentic me that doesn't ever get to come out. The next one, and I'll come back to your question in a moment, Venga, is dependent and endearing. This character strategy, in this character strategy, the strength of the other, whether that is the parental figure, at least as children it generally is, or our partner in relationship, is so solid and my sense of who I am is weak in relationship to that, that I need this other person and I kind of latch on and I need to be taken care of by other people. So the strategy here is I become dependent to those who have resources and agency and I, I, I lean on them to get my needs met. And then I make myself kind of enduring, or sorry, endearing through being helpless and weak. And it's kind of cute and quaint, um, but by being small, by being little or in some ways unable, I'm endearing. I'm like a, a small cat that you find on the side of the road that you just want to pick up and take care of. And I make myself into that being who is just taken care of. And the idea, the, the underlying psychological issue is I haven't figured out how to take care of myself. And so there's a merge that happens in relationship. So question from question is, is there a questionnaire or self-evaluation that is available to find out where I am currently in each of these archetypes? No. <laughs> um, there is a textbook that lists out these character strategies. It's called Experiential Psychotherapy for Couples. It's dense, like it's a textbook. Um, and it gives the best description of what these character strategies are in the Hakomi method. But 
since nobody until this presentation now has put these character strategies together with these archetypes, um, there is not currently a questionnaire like this, but maybe at some point I'll create one. <laughs> Thank you. So we want passionate um, lovers who are in their sensuality. And the gift of charming seductive when it's integrated is that I get to become a charismatic lover. I don't want to be doing it from a place of insecurity, though. Um, the dependent endearing is about connection when it's integrated. I want to be able to open into the depths of intimacy and connection as a lover, but again, not from the place of merging or from needing the other to take care of me. Another question. How common is it to identify in both inward and outward traits outside of integration? Generally, most of us will have one or the other as a go-to. Some of us will have neither. They'll just kind of like through whatever life circumstances you arrived at an integrated version of the lover. And you don't have to deal too much with charming seductive. You don't have to deal too much with dependent endearing. But some of the other character strategies might really have a hold on you. Generally, people have like a couple, like two to three to maybe even four of these character strategies that play out at any given time. It's very unlikely that you would have both the outward and the inward going, though it is possible. I have seen it. And always, 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 it's either one or the other and never both at the same time. Great questions. Okay, so the king. King is in service to the realm. The king um, is about being and bestows his, his blessing to the subjects. And the fertility of the king is the fertility of the realm. At the transpersonal or transcendent level, the king moves into legendary status and enters the collective unconscious or collective conscious, pushing the bounds of what is possible as a human being. The dysfunctions, the unintegrated places within the king. Outward character strategy is called producing. Inward character strategy is called self reliant. So, the producing character strategy. In this strategy, I believe that I can only be worthy of love and connection because of what I create and do, what I achieve in the world. So, I produce, I produce, I produce, I work, 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 work in order to be enough for me and be enough for what I perceive as other people. There is um, a sense, so the, the quality of the king is being. And this dysfunction is that being is not enough. I need to do something to prove it. The inward strategy is called self-reliant. And the, the underlying factor of how this works is that at some point, my needs were not met when I shared them with other people. And so I learned that only I can take care of my needs and that I need to create a wall and have some distance between other people and the vulnerable, wounded, challenging places within myself, self-reliance. So I can be in connection when things feel good, but as soon as I get triggered, I pull back, I push away, and then I take care of me by myself. Uh, so the, the missing experience or the, the healing strat, the healing path to healing for this one is to have experiences with people who are like mature and available to hold you, hold me, being messy, being vulnerable, being triggered, and having them help me get my needs met. So we want kings who are productive, but we want it to come from a place of self-centered being. The fertility of the king is the natural outpouring, not the king leaving himself to run around in circles to try to get things done. But we want productive kings. So when it's integrated, this is a useful aspect. 
Similarly, we want kings who are centered in themselves and know how to take care of themselves, who are sovereign. So when the self-reliance is integrated, it becomes an asset. Okay, so the next two slides, I'm not going to go through in full detail, but this is just a summary of what we talked about, looking at the core archetype, quality, the transcendent version, transcendent quality, and a little overview of what these terms are, alchemist, peacemaker, priest, and legend. Putting this here because I'm recording this, so you can go back in the recording and pause it and look at this information. But everything that's here, I've already said. <laughs> Similarly, this slide has a basic overview of the character strategies with um, a little blurb of what's happening inside of that strategy. So everything that's here, I've said in some way or another, and you can go back and look at the replay if you want to delve into it more. So this is just here for you. Can you restate about the self-reliant and how it doesn't become dependent? Yes. So this is the fear of the self-reliant person is that I will get swallowed or merged or consumed by you in relationship. I need to create my distance. And what needs to be learned is the inhale and exhale of connection. Being fully me, and you being fully you, together in connection, so that I can stay me and be close with you at the same time. And at, without hurting you or pulling away, I can take my own space, or I'm able to have you take your own space. And if you want to go into these dynamics, that's largely through what's called attachment theory in psychology. So to pull it all together, here is the complete mandala of the archetypal psyche. And you'll see at the top here, I have monarch instead of king. And in the west direction, I have priest and priestess. So this is a gender neutral version, it applies to all humans. Um, so we have our eight strategies on the outside character strategies. And those are kind of our reactive layers that we pick up in childhood. As we come more into maturity and our centers, we enter the next layer, which is the monarch, the magician, the warrior, and the lover, integrated archetypes. And then as we move into even more, like, it's kind of a big deal to come into the self, um, expansive, transcendent, um, aspects of our being and our nature, we step into even more transpersonal archetypes, the legend, the alchemist, the peacemaker, and the priestess. In the center of all of this is the self. Psychologically speaking, it's the self. Spiritually speaking, it's spirit. It's connection to all of life. It's knowing one's self throughout the whole. So this is a lot of information <laughs> on some very deep topics. You could pick any one of the buckets on this mandala and drill in um, pretty extensively. But just as a first pass, as an overview on Matt's system for the archetypal nature of the psyche, here it is. I will open it up for other questions or comments. Question is, in addition to learning more about attachment theory, which resources would you recommend to continue learning about how to integrate towards any given archetype? Mm. So there is not a lot there's not great literature out there on these character strategies presently it is buried into instruction manuals for how to learn the hakomi method of somatic psychotherapy 
at some point, ideally, some Hakomi instructor writes a book for the public on these strategies because they are awesome. They are super useful. So what you can do now is go to any Hakomi trained therapist and ask them if they work with and use the character map. It's called the character map. And if they know what you're talking about, then you can work with them to identify what's happening for you and then try to integrate them more. They almost certainly are not using that character map in this mandala form in connection with the archetypes. Like I said, what I'm giving you here, it's brand new and it's unique to me. So um, hang out with me more, I guess, would be the answer. <laughs> Question, what is the significance of the cardinal directions associated with the archetypes? How do I use or apply them in working with the archetypes? Yeah, beautiful. So the directions and the elements that I gave, uh, let's just scroll back here. Every indigenous spiritual tradition that we know of has some version of calling in the directions as a spiritual practice and a way to open into sacred space. So these directions are here in case you have any prayerful or ceremonial connection to them. And it's just weaving together more of the map of what other humans are doing. Same with the elements. Um, you know, medieval alchemy has these elements, but also many, many, many indigenous spiritual traditions work with um, earth, wind, fire, and water. And so if you have a connection already with them, then you can start to weave these together with these archetypes within yourself. I'm going to voice my question. <clears throat> yes. Uh, what uh, I think in terms of what Ryan asked, how do I find out which one I want to pick up? Yeah. So spend some time here. Hmm. And then consider when you are triggered, where do you go? How do you act? So this is not the wounded, hurt place of collapse, although that can certainly happen within sensitive and withdrawn. The way that these show up is, I'm not getting my needs met. I need to do something. Where do you go? What behavior do you turn to when you need to get your needs met? And somewhere on here is a pretty good map. You'll probably land somewhere in there. Cool. Good question. Okay. Wonderful. So thank you everybody for joining me today. Um, appreciate all the questions. They really add a lot to the richness of what I share. So thanks for participating. Um, either later today or tomorrow, this will go up on my website as a video so you can go back and reference it. And it's on the Facebook Live. So if you're in the Facebook group, you can check it there. Tomorrow's talk is the last one in the series. And that will be a discussion of the role of men's work today. So given all of this background and foundation that we've done over the last three lectures, including this one, what does men's work mean? How do we do it? What makes it effective? And why do we care? So that's where we're going tomorrow. Beautiful. Thank you, thank you, thank you.